So we're going to do some more Galois theory. And as I uh, told you last time, it's just a single theorem, which is actually pretty short, but you should learn how to use it. So the theorem itself, as I had it on the board last time, so F will be a field, and we look at extensions, Galois extensions, and these are extensions that you get by forming the splitting field. So you take your favorite polynomial F, and you look at the field, I think it was denoted by F sub F, which is sort of a somewhat difficult notation, and maybe now that Francesco has left, I changed the notation to a, something that you can immediately understand. This is the splitting field of the polynomial F over F. This will be a Galois extension, usually, and usually means that it will certainly be the case if you take your F to be a separable polynomial, meaning that it has distinct roots, then it always works. And if your f happens to be finite or characteristic zero, you needn't worry anyway, you will always get a Galois extension. I think it was actually called k most of the time. And then we saw that what you need to do is look at the associated Galois group. And the Galois group is defined abstractly. So g, the Galois group of k over f, is defined as the group of automorphisms, field automorphisms of K that are the identity on F. So it's a very abstract definition, and what you try and do usually is to get a concrete field by looking at this F, and if I assume it to be separable, as I said, that needn't be the case, but usually it is, then you can factor it in the splitting field, almost by definition of the splitting field, so it has N roots, if N is the degree, that are going to be distinct, and then this abstract Galba group is some permutation group on the roots. And the only problem is that it may not be the full permutation group on the roots, it's in general a subgroup. So you may view it as a subgroup of the, of the group Sn permuting the roots alpha 1 to alpha n. And then the question is, if you are given an f, in fact two f's, a capital F and a small f, how do you actually find your Galba group? And I think we did two examples x cubed minus 2 and x to the 4 minus 2 in the case where f equals q. These are sort of characteristic examples in characteristic 0. As it happens, there's also a finite field course. And of course, you can also take your f to be finite. And then life is actually easier since these Galba groups, they can be somewhat complicated as we've seen. We found the dihedral group, d4 for the polynomial x to the 4 minus 2 over the rationals. But if you're dealing with finite fields, and the simplest example, if you take f equal to fp, the field of p elements, then we've seen in the lectures by Francesco that if you want to have an extension of degree n of that field, then it has a name, it's called fp to the n. There will be a field having p to the n elements, and the degree is n, let me denote it like this. And in fact, this field is really just determined by its degree, so it's completely different over the rationals, there's infinitely many quadratic fields. Over finite fields, there will just be a single quadratic extension. Since, in fact, this field consists of those elements, you can say, if you like algebraic closures, which is very complicated and abstract, you say this as a set, it is just the, the set of the roots of a polynomial. Namely, these are all alphas in the algebraic closure that satisfy alpha to the p to the n minus alpha equals zero. So this is indeed a special case. It's a splitting field of the polynomial over fp, split over fp, of x to the p to the n minus x. So it has a very concrete description. It just consists of elements which the p to the nth power is just equal to the element itself. And just by staring at it, at the whole thing, you almost see the Galois group, since if your field has characteristic p and it is finite, you always get for free an automorphism called the Frobenius, Frob p. And frop p is the thing that sends everything to its pth power. So the automorphism frop p is defined by mapping any x to x to the p. And the claim is that this is, is in fact an automorphism of fp to the n over fp. And why is that? Well, that's because in characteristic p, you know that Raising to the power p, which certainly respects multiplication, also respects addition. It's because x plus y to the p, 
that is something you learn how to compute using Newton's binomial formula, but in characteristic P, all these binomial coefficients in the middle, they disappear, since you go mod P, and you see it's just x to the P plus y to the P. This is a generality in characteristic P, in F of characteristic P. So this will be another morphism, and staring at the definition of FP to the N, you see that this is an automorphism that you need to apply N times, since if you apply Frobenius N times, you keep raising to, raising to the power P N times, then you raise to the power P to the N, and then you see you exactly get the identity on all, all alphas in your extension field. If you take a smaller power, then you won't have enough roots of the polynomial, so you, then you don't get it. So you see that in here, this Frobenius element, it has order N, and the general theory tells you that the Galba group will actually be of order N. So we're done. It's just generated by Frobenius. So this group, the Galba group of FP to the N over FP, is a cyclic group generated by Frobenius. So it's a cyclic group. Let me denote it like this. There's Frob P that generates it, and its order is N. So it's a cyclic group. It's just a group Z mod N, the cyclic group of order N. And in this case, the Galba theory is pretty trivial since subgroups of finite groups, yeah, here we have these, there's many subgroup, subgroups of SN. In fact, any finite group fits into an SN. But if you have a finite cyclic group, how do you find the subgroups? Do we know that? We have a cyclic group of order 10, say, how many subgroups can you find? For each divisor, exactly, every subgroup of Z mod N, Z, a cyclic group of order N, is uniquely determined by its divisor. And that means that if you're given your favorite FP, and someone tells you, can you find all the subfields between FP and FP to the 12, just to give an example, that's a degree 12 extension, as we've seen, the only thing you need to do is list the divisors of 12. And if you do them in a in slightly intelligent way, just looking by division, there's the divisor 1, there's the divisor 2, there's the divisor 4, 12, 3, 6, 12. These are all divisors of 12, as you see. And if there's an upgoing line, then this number d d divides the next one. Every time you can go two ways, you can add a factor 2 or a factor 3, if still possible, and then you end up at 12. Which means that the diagram of fields it's very easy to see. It is just fp to the 6, fp cubed, mm, I guess 2 divided 6 as well, right? So I hope this is correct. This is uh, higher arithmetic, as you see, divisors of 12. So you can just fill in the fields, the subfields, exactly as you fill in the divisors. OK, and you don't need to copy everything. So that means that finite fields are easy, way easier than extensions of the rationals, which means that these complicated groups that we found, this was S3, that was D4, you can also do it over a finite field. So what do you get? I think that's one of the exercises that I gave you. So what is a splitting field of x cubed minus 2 over fp if you take your favorite value of p, 2, 3, 5, 7, as many as you like. Well, if you want to know what the splitting field is, you should try and factor it over some extension field. How does x cubed minus 2 factor over f2? Just x cubed, right? So it has three factors x. It has a triple zero, zero. So you see the polynomial itself is not separable over f2, but the roots, they're all identical, equal to zero. The extension they generate is just f2 itself, which is in fact a Galba extension that's equal to the ground field. Trivial group, nothing happens. Okay, that was a not so complicated one. What about x cubed minus two if you take it mod three? What do you get? Well, raising to the power 3 in characteristic 3 is easy, right? So then it's just the same thing as x minus 2 to the power 3. 
So it has again a triple root equal to two and the field that you get is simply F3. Okay, what about F5? Is, is two a cube in F5? Two is minus three, definitely. So? So how many roots does the polynomial x cubed minus two have over f5? Does it have roots at all? Help him a little bit. What's he trying to say? You see you need to be able to factor polynomials over finite fields. So good that we know about finite fields. And this is not a very complicated one. Why is two a cube? Modulo 5. If I look at the non-zero elements in F5, F5 star, that's a group of order 4, right? And in groups of order 4, everything is a cube. So it certainly has a root. And does it have three roots or just one? Just one, right? In fact, that's where you, have, you extend the army a little bit. You see that two is a, is a uniquely cube. It's a cube of three, actually. Three cubed 27 is two modulo five. So it has a root. And there's a quadratic factor left, which has no roots, apparently. So if you join the roots of that one, what do you get? Something quadratic over F5. And there's only one quadratic extension of F5, which is F25. So no calculations are needed. It has to be F25. You should realize over F5, things are very rigid, right? For instance, if you take F5 and you take something which is not a square, like square root 2, then you get exactly the, sorry, F5 square root 2, you get exactly the same field as when you take F5 square root 3. Over Q, that's completely wrong. Square root 2 and square root 3, we've seen in the examples, are different quadratic extensions over Q. Over F5, they're the same. And why is that? Well, 2 and 3, the product is just 1. One is the inverse of the other. So obviously, if you take square root of this one, the other one is square root of one over the thing. So same extension. You see, there's nothing that can go wrong for finite fields. F25, what about p equals 7? What do you think? Is 2 a cube? The non-zero elements are order 6, right? So that's divisible by 3. So the argument I just gave that it has a unique root actually doesn't work. Doesn't have a root. If you cube anything mod 7, what do you get if it's not 0? Plus or minus 1, right? There's six elements, and you cube them. There's two left. It has to be plus or minus 1. And yeah, 2 is not plus or minus 1. So apparently, the 2 is not a cube. So it does not have roots. Meaning? And you see it doesn't have a root, so it's apparently it's irreducible over F7. So if you join one root, you get F7 cubed. Now the most difficult part to compute what 7 cubed is, and I think that is 343. And then apparently the other roots are already in. Why is that? Yeah, if you, did the, if you do the same thing over the rationals, you need to get something with degree 6, right? If you join one root and you call it cube root of 2, you're not there yet. You need more. Actually, roots of unity, cube roots of unity, and then you get something at degree 6. That, won that won't happen here. You cannot get S3 as a Galois group over F7, because any Galois group over a finite field is finite cyclic, so not S3. And explicitly, the cube roots are obviously in F7. Why? Because the units there, it's a group of order 6, cube roots are in there. Easy, right? That should be the feeling. <laughs> okay. Okay, let me do one more, then one example, and then you're done with finite fields, uh, maybe, uh, for now. What about x to the 4 minus 2? In degree 4, that's even a little bit nastier since then you can have a root or no root, but if it has no roots, it can be two quadratic factors, so it's a bit painful. So maybe you want to be a little bit more intelligent. If you want to know, 
in, yeah, if you take a root of such a polynomial, you want to know in which fp to the n it lives, then you see that a non-zero element, alpha, lives in fp to the n, and non-zero means it's in the group of units. That means exactly that it is a root of this polynomial difference from zero, so this is if and only if alpha to the p to the n minus one equals one. Yeah, since this polynomial is x times x to the p to the n minus one minus one, it has to be root of that one. So you may as well think of a root of this polynomial as being a fourth root of two. So any alpha, which is a root of this polynomial, if you take its fourth power, you get two. And then the only question is, which power do you need to take to get one? Well, of course it depends what p is. Here again, then nothing happens, right? You just get f2 because the, the only roots are zeros. That's a trivial case. For f3, if you have an element alpha for which the fourth power is equal to two in f3, if I square it again, what do I get? Two square mod three is one. So that means that if you take a root of that polynomial and you raise it to the power eight, you get one. And if you take it to a smaller power, like four, you don't get one, you get two. So the order of the elements is going to be eight in the multiplicative group. So you don't need to think which finite field over F3 can I take for which you have an element of order eight. That's all it takes, as you see. Well, what's the smallest one? F9, exactly, since F9 star has order eight. Done. F25, sorry, F5. Alpha to the four equals two. And then I raise it to which power to get one? Alpha to the four is two. What will the order be? Two square mod five is? Minus one, maybe? Okay, agree. So alpha to the eight is minus one. And which power of alpha will be one? Square one minus one, one more time, you get one. So alpha to the 16 will be equal to one. So you have an element alpha, which is 16 power is one, and the eight power is not one. The order is 16. So we need an extension of F5 that has an element of order 16. So what do you want? Just there, you need, you take P equal to five, and you want 16 to divide five to the N minus one. What is the smallest N? You're just looking at, uh, at 5 modulo 16, right? And what is the order of 5 modulo 16? This is all, all elementary school arithmetic, which does, doesn't mean it's easy. <laughs> it's been a while for me, actually. So what is the smallest power of 5? If you subtract 1, it's going to be divisible by 16. 625, anybody less than 625? It's not five, it's not 25, what about 125, 4 divided by 16, no. 625, good. Okay, I guess you get uh, the message, right? Do we need to do this one? We can say, well, it shouldn't be too complicated. Same story, alpha to the four equals two in F7. What's the order of two in F7, in the multiplicative group? Three, two cubed, eight is one. So you get an element of order 12. What is the smallest power of seven? If you subtract one, it's going to be divisible by 12. 49. 49. So you see, if you know your elementary school arithmetic, this exercise is essentially trivial. You need to be able to square seven, which is 49, which is 48 plus one, and 48 is divisible by 12. Okay, so you can continue any way you like. So, finite fields, there isn't much happening. It's just about the multiplicative group, orders of elements, and if you know that, you're fine. So let's go back to characteristic zero. Another important example that we'll also use later this week. So, 
let me erase the main theorem, which is this one. Well, it's not actually stated, but the context. So we just decided that life gets more interesting in characteristic zero. And if you think it's too difficult, you can always reduce mod p to make life easy, then you're into the realm of finite fields, which is something very useful in number theory in general. If you have a complicated problem, you make it easy by doing something slightly intelligent. And if people have told you, let's do it this way, that helps. That's called education. Okay. So you see all elements in finite fields are roots of unity. Except for zero, you can take a power and you get one. They all have finite order. You can wonder what happens if you adjoin roots of unity to fields and characteristics zero. And the easiest example to think of, if you take the ground field, the simplest field, in characteristic zero, what happens if you adjoin a p through the unity? Q zeta p. And if you understand that, then we can look at Q zeta n for n any integer. Right? So, zeta p is a primitive p through the unity. And then there's two kinds of people, people who are like uh, complex numbers. They will say, well, if you take e to the 2 pi i and you divide it by p, that's a complex number. If you raise it to the power p, you get 1. It's not itself equal to 1, so it has order p. It's an element of order p in uh, the complex number in C star. And there's algebraic people that just want to know the irreducible polynomial. And they say, well, if I take a root of x to the p minus 1, and it's different from 1, it will be a root of this polynomial, which is the p psychotomic polynomial, phi p, which is x to the p minus 1 plus x to the p minus 2 plus x plus 1. So it's a degree p minus 1 polynomial, and all coefficients are equal to 1. And now the key question is, is this an irreducible polynomial? Everybody's nodding, yes, it is. Is that immediately obvious? Or should I say that by intimidation this is obviously irreducible? <laughs> or do we know a reason why it is actually irreducible? I think René Schoff told me yesterday that actually Gauss spends two pages on the proof of this. Is that correct, René? Yeah, okay. We are not Gauss, so let's find an easier proof. We just used that people after Gauss also had intelligent things to say. Do you guys know about Eisenstein? A little bit later. And Eisenstein has a neat criterion that often tells you that polynomials are irreducible. Does anybody know what it is? So you can have polynomials that are Eisenstein at P. Yeah, a polynomial like if you think y is x to the 7 minus 2 irreducible, that's maybe not so obvious if you just stare at the whole thing. It doesn't have roots, but it could have a factor 3 and of degree 3 and degree 4, right? But people know Eisenstein say, oh, this is Eisenstein at 2. That's obviously irreducible. So what does it mean to be Eisenstein at 2 or p? And you don't have a microphone, so you have a little bit of an advantage, of course, to force the solution upon you, but you can still say, shout, well, that simply means that if you reduce mod p, which is something you want to be able to do anyway, what do you get? You just get x to the something. Only the highest coefficient survives. All the rest disappears. That's a good example. If you go mod 2, only x to the 7 is left. That is, uh, the only, that's the first criterion, to be Einstein at P. There's a second criterion, so it could just be x to the 7, which is certainly not irreducible. What's the second half of the statement? Yes, the constant coefficient, which has to be divisible by P, because it vanishes mod P, should not be divisible by P squared. And 2 is not divisible by 2 squared, obviously, so that's a good example. Okay, that is a useful, a useful criterion, but it doesn't look like you can apply it here. All the coefficients are equal to 1. Exactly. Then there's this trick, which may be due to Eisenstein. I'm not exactly sure. If you look at phi p and you shift it by 1, x plus 1, what do you get? You get x plus 1 to the p minus 1 divided by x plus 1 minus 1, which is x. And if you now... This is actually a polynomial, right? So the constant coefficient will vanish, so it will be divisible by x. 
And if you go mod p, what do you get? It starts with x to the p minus 1, right? x to the p divided by x, x to the p minus 1. And then you get all this stuff with binomial coefficients, which I just reminded you that they're all divisible by p except for the last one, right? The last one is, a, is a, then you have a 1 minus 1 that disappears. So the constant coefficient becomes p over 1, right? So this is what it is, mod p. And the constant coefficient, that's the binomial coefficient p over 1, is just equal to p, which is not divisible by p squared. So you see this polynomial is Eisenstein at p. If you know the criteria, you have a one-line proof rather than two pages as in Gauss. So you see mathematics develops and things get easier over time. Right, so this is an irreducible polynomial, meaning that this is a, an extension of degree p minus 1. Is it actually the splitting field of the polynomial? What are the roots of phi p? Well, the other p fields of unity are just the powers of this one, right? So this phi p, you can factor it as the product of x minus zeta p to the i, and you let i range from 1 up to p minus 1. So you see that all the roots of the polynomial are just powers of zeta p. They're contained in this field, so this is the splitting field of the polynomial x to the p minus 1 over q. So here's our Galois extension. And I think in that reminded you of the Galois group, since an automorphism of Q zeta p is determined by what it does on zeta p, since anything else is a power of zeta p as far as roots go, right? So the only thing you can do here, if you have any a, you can look at the element that sends zeta p to zeta p to the a. And if a is not divisible by p, this will again be a primitive p to the unity. And it will be actually a root of this polynomial. So you see that this extends to an automorphism of the field. So this is an element of the Galois group of Q zeta p over p. Whenever you take p not dividing a. And in fact, if you then stare at what the group is going to look like, you see this group is just a mildly disguised version of the group z mod p z star. So if you apply sigma a and then sigma b, you raise to the power a and then to the power b, then you raise to the power a b, by these power rules, right, for exponents. So you see that sigma a, sigma a after times sigma b is just sigma a b. So you just multiply your exponents mod p, which is indeed a group for a p minus 1. Which means that if someone hands you a p, and as it happens in the exercises, you were handed, what was it, p equals 7, I think, exercise 2? Right. So if p happens to be 7, then you get a group of order 6. And do we know which group it is of order 6? F7 star or C mod 7 Z star, which group is that? I think last week we decided there were not too many groups of order 6 anyway, right? It was S3. Yeah, and which group of order 6 is this? Yeah, that's one way of denoting it. I just want to know where it is cyclic. I mean, S3 also is order 6. Exactly, this is the cyclic one, cyclic one, where you want to say it, of order 6. And then we know all the subgroups. Since we just did the cyclic case already, for every divisor of 6, there will be an extension of that degree. So Q zeta 7 has a Galois group over Q, which is cyclic of order 6. It's the group Z mod 7 Z star, which means that there will be a quadratic extension and there will be a cubic extension. Together, they lay inside Q zeta 7. 
So in this case, the group theory is very easy. Yeah, it depends on the Galois extension. Sometimes the group is very easy, and then you have question marks in your field diagram. And sometimes the fields are very easy, and you have to recover the group. Now it goes from groups to fields. So there's two question marks. And what do you want to say for a question mark? Well, something quadratic, you would rather write q square root something. How would you find the something? And here you need something which is even cubic. So how on earth would you get a cubic polynomial of something that generates the field? That's what it means to compute actual fields, right? Rather say they exist. It may be good, but many people are just educated as engineers and say, okay, if something exists, I want to have it in my hands. And saying that there is a quadratic field, yeah, there's many quadratic fields over Q. This one is the unique quadratic subfield of Q zeta seven. So what is the easier one or the more complicated one? Or just equally complicated? Who tried? Who dares to say he tried? <laughs> you all had a nice weekend, I can tell. Okay, well, that's fine. If you want to find these fields, you should think of the subgroups of Z mod 7Z star they correspond to. Since what we need to do is go back from a subgroup to a corresponding subfield. And what are the groups of order two and three? Well, there's the group of order two, generated by minus one. And there's also, there's a, so that's an order two and index three. So it will correspond to this field. Yeah, here the corresponding subgroup has order two, generated by minus one. If you want, you can put bars to indicate that everything is mod seven. And what is the subgroup of order three of Z mod seven Z star, which is index two? Do we know an element of order three in Z mod seven Z star? Two, exactly. That's why we did the warming up, right? With x to the three minus two, x to the four minus two, two mod p, as we know it now more, more or less by heart. If you take two mod seven, you get something of order three. So to, do, to actually exhibit these fields, what do you want? You want elements that generate the question marks. So here you can say I need an element which is going to be invariant under this automorphism corresponding to minus one. And what is minus one? Sigma minus one. That's the automorphism that sends zeta seven to zeta seven inverse. So it doesn't fix zeta seven, as you see. So can you think of an element which is fixed by sigma minus one, which lies in this field? And there's many answers. Some of them are just silly answers. Zero, one, 25. They're certainly fixed because they're in the ground field. They don't help me. I want something outside the field which is really going to generate it, this cubic field. So what is an intelligent element to take? Sorry? Yeah, if I, so you have to pick your favorite element alpha, which is in this field and outside Q, and an obvious choice here to make something invariant under an automorphism that switches two things, well, what do you take? The sum or the product? Well, the product is not a good idea, then you get one. But the sum is pretty good. This will certainly be invariant. Do you think that it might be in Q by accident? Will it be possible? Yeah, accidents happen in life, so you have to be careful, right? Now for the product, it's pretty clear that you end up in Q. The sum looks like it's not in Q. And if it's not in Q, it has to be cubic over Q, so it has to satisfy a cubic polynomial. How would you find it? You can do two things. You can look at the, the, the conjugates. So you apply an element outside this group and you see where it goes to. It will have, alpha will have two conjugates. 
That is one, one way to do it. So for instance, you apply sigma two, and you say, well, if I look at alpha prime, which is sigma two of this one, which is zeta seven squared plus zeta seven to the minus two, and I look at alpha triple prime, if I apply it one more time, then most likely the polynomial having alpha, alpha prime, and alpha double prime will end up with having coefficients in Q. But that's a lot of work, right? That's certainly correct. But I don't think I want to do it, since doing actual calculations on a whiteboard, a tiny whiteboard, is something you try and avoid. So maybe we can alpha square. You just look at the powers, right? That is zeta seven square plus two plus zeta seven to the minus two, right? That's just by Newton's binomial formula, binomial formula, and zeta seven times its inverse is one, and you get a two in the middle. And alpha cubed, in the same way, zeta seven cubed plus three times zeta seven plus three times zeta seven to the minus one plus zeta seven to the minus three. And maybe by just intelligent staring, you can see the minimal polynomial. Who's good at intelligent staring? Or who has a geometric feeling for seven, seven roots of unity? It also works. Yeah, if you think of the seven roots of unity, there's one, well, should be the middle. Yeah, it looks pretty good, right? Seven, not so easy to do, I think, but I can try. Circle into seven parts, what do you think? Let me step back. I think this is terrific. I never did better. Here is zeta seven, right? On the unit sphere, unit circle in the complex plane. Zeta seven square, zeta seven cubed, zeta seven to the four, zeta seven to the five, zeta seven to the six. What happens if you add up all these roots of unity? All six of them and also one. What do you get? You get all the roots back to the seven minus one, and if you add them, well, by symmetry, if you sort of pull in all these directions, uh, you get zero, right? You also say x to the seven minus one, it's next highest coefficient, that's is a zero. So if you sum all the primitive seventh roots of unity, you get minus one. And now we stare again. Can you find the sum of all seventh roots of unity by manipulating this a little bit? For instance, if I start by alpha cubed, Right? And I subtract twice alpha. I get all coefficients one, right? And then I add alpha square, which is this one. How many roots of unity do I get? All six of them and a plus two, right? So, minus one, this is a complicated calculation, right? How much do you have to get zero? Yeah, this one is a sum of these four roots of unity, since I removed the threes by subtracting two alpha. And if we add this one, then I get the two missing seven roots of unity, and I get a plus two. So we get minus one plus two, so it's one. So if you subtract one, I get zero. Maybe you don't like this, because it's staring, and if you don't like it, you do what I erased, and then you do a calculation, and you also find it. You see that the polynomial, of which this is a root, is x cubed uh, plus x squared, minus two x plus one. So this is the minimal polynomial of zeta seven plus zeta seven inverse. 
So now we really have found the field. So it's a Q alpha for a completely explicit alpha. That was some work. What about this one? You can of course give it a name, say Q beta. And then we need to find some beta that does it. Can we think of something invariant under this subgroup, generated by two? There's a standard way, if you have a random element, you can make it invariant under a subgroup. And what do you do? You just take all the images under the subgroup and you add them. So if you take your beta, if you start with zeta 7, of course that's not invariant, since if you apply the element sigma 2, then zeta 7 gets squared. So that means that if you apply the elements of this group, you get three elements, zeta 7, zeta 7 squared, and if you apply it one more time, you get zeta 7 twice squared to the 4, and if you square again, you're back at 1. That's order 3. So these are the images of zeta 7 under the three elements in this group, which means that if you take the sum of them, you will be invariant. So this beta has to be quadratic over Q. And again, it might just be rational if you're unlucky. Is there a reason why this will not be in Q? There's two answers again. You can just compute your reducible polynomial, which is just going to be quadratic, right? And you say, well, here's the quadratic polynomial. It's a root of, and you see it has a true square root outside Q. Or you say, well, if this were rational, equal to whatever, some rational number c, then zeta 7 would be a root of x to the 4 plus x squared plus x minus c, a degree 4 polynomial. But zeta 7 has an irreducible of degree 6, so it cannot be a root of a degree 4 polynomial. So it will not be in Q. So before you do the calculation, you know that this is outside Q, so it has to be a generator of the quadratic field. And maybe you're now happy to say, okay, I found my beta and Whatever it is, I don't care. Some people do care. They say, well, OK, let's try and actually square the whole thing. And do we want to do that? When am I supposed to stop? Mm, 20 past? Yeah. Right. OK. Well, then I think that you certainly can, by yourself, compute beta square, stare at it, and write down the quadratic polynomial. And if you do it correctly, you will find that Q beta is the quadratic field Q square root minus 7. And it's no coincidence that's the same 7 that you have there. So you might think, what is the quadratic subfield of Q zeta p in general? That's what Gauss did. And you discover the Gauss sum, which is quadratic over Q. Let's do something slightly different in the last, whatever, five or six minutes. What was exercise 3? Q zeta something which was not prime, right? 15, good. OK. So the question is, if p is not prime, because it's equal to 15, what do you do? You can, of course, replace everything, your p, by 15, and hope that it remains correct. So you can take zeta 15 and define it whatever way you want, put to the 2 pi i over 15. That's one definition, but that doesn't give you the reducible polynomial. How would you find the polynomial 515 if you really want to? Maybe you don't want it, but this degree would be nice. Do we know? You can remember what Inda told us, right? You just encounter these factors if you factor x to the 15 minus 1. Yeah, you say, well, yeah, if you think of the polynomial x to the 15 minus 1, then you get a multiple of this one. You have too many roots. You do not want roots of x to the 5 minus 1. They are fifth roots of unity. 
and also not the roots of x cubed minus 1. These are two divisors of 15. But the x minus 1 actually divided out twice, but only once. So that's the formula that was on the slides last week. So if you want, you can do the computation and find this polynomial. And what will the degree be? Sixteen minus eight, which is eight. I guess she told you already that actually what I wrote down here, that the Galois group for the splitting field, that you can replace primes by non-primes. You can send zeta 15 to zeta 15 to the A, as long as your A is co-prime to 15. And who, how many powers do you have? There's one up to 14 that you can take, but it should be co-prime to 3 and 5. And that's an error, something that she called phi of 15, which was the order of Z mod 15 Z star, which is the Galois group of Q data 15 over Q. And what is phi 15? 8. So this is a degree 8 extension. Just like x to the 4 minus 2, but easier because the group is so easy. And now you can think of, you guys know the Chinese remainder theorem, right? It tells you always that if you have a composite modulus, you can just mod 15, you can do it mod 3 and mod 5. That's for the rings, so it's also for the unit groups. And these groups, we recognize, these are actually z mod pz stars. They correspond to q zeta 3 and q zeta 5, which is no wonder since in here you find zeta 3 and zeta 5 because they're powers of zeta 15. And if you have both zeta 3 and zeta 5 and you take the product, you will have order 15. So this is just a field that you can also get in two steps. And that means exactly that q zeta 15 you can view it as made up from two fields, namely Q zeta 3, which is quadratic over Q, and Q zeta 5, which is degree 4 and cyclic. So for composite cyclotomic fields, it helps if you can factor. And 15 being 3 times 5 tells you that this degree 8 field, you can make it out of a quadratic field and a cyclic field of degree 4. So this group is something cyclic of order 2, z mod 2z times z mod 4z. And now it's again, it's simple group theory. If you have a group of order 8, which is abelian, 2 times 4, you can just write down all the subgroups and think of the corresponding fields. And then you discover that to find all the subfields, you can try and do several more or less intelligent things where more intelligent just means it takes less time. And it is useful to know, to make the two diagrams at the same time. I think I have two minutes left, so we will get to the end, but it doesn't matter. Two times four, right? Corresponding to the group Z mod 2Z times Z mod 4Z. Well, z mod 4z has a unique subgroup of index 2, right? So already you know that in here there will be a subfield that we still need to figure out. And actually it has to do with this subfield because qz, that's where the subgroup lives, has a unique subgroup of order 2 generated by minus 1. So here is also a subfield which is quadratic. And this degree 4 field, you get it by taking the compositum of these two. And what are the corresponding subgroups? Well, if you want, you can just start your work here and say, well, Q zeta 5, I already did it. Unfortunately, 5 or 7. Well, it's only easier, right? So what will it be? The subgroup here is minus 1 mod 5, or a 2. So this field will be Q zeta 5 plus zeta 5 inverse. And if you wonder which field that is, 
you just take the square, and then we think what we just said. If you add these two, alpha square plus alpha, what do you get? All primitive fifth roots of unity plus two. Same thing. So the answer is going to be one. Minus one is zero. So this alpha, in fact, is a well-known number. It's called the golden ratio. Square root five. That's by the formula that we had in the first lecture, the ABC formula, if you want. And you may have heard about the golden ratio and the regular pentagon inside the circle and geometric constructions, blah, blah, blah. That's all this observation. So the quadratic field is Q square root five. which is a bit more explicit than zeta 5 and zeta 5 inverse. And zeta 3, you've seen it several times, that's minus 1 half plus the square root of minus 3. So this field is actually something you also know. Q zeta 3 is Q square root minus 3. It helps to have a certain number of small examples at your disposal that you can sort of use any time you run into it. Because they're small, you encounter them all the time. And if you remember, if you have two quadratic fields, q squared of minus 3 and q squared of 5, there's an easy way to make a different quadratic field by just taking the product that will give you q squared of minus 15. Which is not, it's a different field, but it lives in the compositor. And you see that this is the, just like the q squared of 2 squared of 3 field that in the head on the board, but now it's squared of minus 3 and squared of 5. So our diagram, when it starts growing, this is simply the biquadratic field, square root minus 3, square root 5. And I'm out of time, so the rest will be an exercise. There's only one, fel one uh, field lacking. Which one? There's always this zeta plus zeta inverse, right? Called the real subfield of the cyclotomic field. Because you think about it, it's a thing plus one other thing, this will also always be a real number. And in this case, it will not be Q zeta 5, it will certainly not be that one, it's still lacking. So if they give this a name, are we out of Greek letters already? Gamma, maybe? Yeah. Then Q gamma will actually be here. And it's your exercise to find an irreducible pronomen, since my time's up. So, have a nice break. <laughs>